The spell that had been cast on Prince Devon of Lantimos was to be dispelled by the goddess of the small sun who had the scent of daisies. Finally, this prophecy was to be fulfilled, for which he had been waiting for more than ten years. One of his knights brought her to him. He could not see her with his own eyes, so he had to believe everything the servant said. She was the only young girl named Evelyn in Diego's family, so she had to be the goddess of the little sun. She really smelled like daisies, and that was the only reference point for the dark prince. He ordered her to be locked in this room until tomorrow. The fair-haired girl tried to stop the prince with her cry and not let the knight stop her, but he knew special tactics that made her quickly weaken in his hands. When Evelyn was seven years old, her family finally moved to a new home, which was very exciting for her because she had been wanting to leave the area for a long time. A man came up to her and told her that everyone praised her, so he was happy to meet such a capable girl. They went to the man's huge estate. Evelyn was very happy because she did not like the life in the temple. Now she would not have to eat only grass and rice soup all the time and be punished by the elders. Finally, she had a home she could always return to and a loving father. She saw a familiar pattern on the flag hanging outside the huge mansion. It depicted the sun goddess, the symbol of the Diego clan. Suddenly she remembered that she was in the world inside the novel. She liked the same novel so much that she bought it even in paperback. The cover of the first volume depicted the sun goddess, and, if the girl was right, it consisted of three parts. The novel described a special divine power that was able to heal incurable diseases and lift curses that no one else could. Among the characters in the novel was the main character, named Cordelia, who had this divine power. She grew up in a temple orphanage and then was adopted by Diego, who abused her and used her powers for his own purposes. Despite all this, the main character, as in most novels, was able to overcome all difficulties, met the love of her life, and lived happily ever after. And the role of Evelyn in this story was that she was a minor character who appeared briefly at the very beginning. Her fate was quite similar to Cordelia's, but only at the very beginning. At the age of 15, a blonde girl was abused by her foster father because she could not use her powers. The orphanage told her that she had great powers. He spent a lot of money on her to bring her here, but his investment was in vain. In the story, Evelyn spent too much power, so she died when she was not yet 13 years old. The divine powers are not infinite, so if you spend them before they have time to recover, you can die. After the death of his first adopted daughter, Count Diego had to take Cordelia under his care, and Evelyn remained only a means of demonstrating the divine power. Even with the same abilities, someone still dies and someone stays alive. However, the girl of the world's hair was still alive. She was able to hold on because she did not use the divine power. She had to survive because as long as she was alive, Count Diego would not adopt Cordelia, and in the story, the prince had to kidnap a young girl from Count Diego's family. It was supposed to be Cordelia, but now it's going to be Evelyn. She will get out of here and gain her freedom. The Count's abuse of the girl did not stop, but she endured and held on. One day, the Count ordered her to use her powers, and if she refused, he would kill the puppy. She used magic to save the poor dog, but the Count did not keep his promise. Count Diego also had a son named Killian Diego. He always visited Evelyn and promised that he would find a way for her to get out of here, but his words never came true. When the blonde girl first arrived at the house, the basement, which was supposed to be her room, already showed signs of previous abuse. Count Diego was a truly horrible man, so it was easy to miss that these marks were left by his son Killian. Evelyn's brother always tried to help her whenever she went out on the estate, he would treat her marks from the Earl's abuse and ask her how else he could help her. To this request, the girl always replied that the boy should kill the Count. This was what she had always wanted. The boy always avoided fulfilling this request, but his question always encouraged the girl to have hope. In the end, Evelyn still had one request that her brother could fulfill without killing her father. It was lighter than the previous one, but still quite difficult. Evelyn asked him to bring her a pendant with a large yellow gemstone that she wanted to wear to the debutante ball. At the tea party, the other ladies noticed a scratch on Evelyn's precious face. The girl replied that it was caused by a careless fall. The girl could not believe that the ladies were such simple-minded conversationalists. Such a wound would hardly have been caused by a simple fall. 
Most likely, they believed everything they were told because of the greenhouse conditions in which they grew up. The ladies' tea party was interrupted by Sir Killian, who called Evelyn's name, which caused a pleasant shock to the girl's companions. He handed her a small box with the jewelry she had asked for earlier. This jewelry looked like an ordinary medallion, but in fact it contained a magical power that was the source of the flower scent. It was the only thing missing to complete her image in order to impersonate the main character. She thanked her brother for getting the medallion for his sister, even though it was hard to get anyway. Now she just had to wait for the debutante ball. The other ladies made the comment that Killian and Evelyn seemed quite friendly for relatives of a royal family. To others, Killian looked charming and responsible as the captain of the princess's guard. These qualities were enough to make ordinary ladies interested in him. The lady asked Killian what kind of girl he liked, and he replied that he liked girls with blonde hair and blue eyes like the sea. As he was saying this, he looked over at Evelyn, who was sitting next to the lady. She was a perfect match for his type. She also wondered who Killian's partner would be at the ball, and asked the blonde girl the same question. The latter was too absorbed in her thoughts that she would soon be leaving this house. The dark prince, who lost his eyesight due to a curse, had to hear that the goddess of the small sun, who smelled of chamomile, was to deliver him from the curse. After hearing this prediction, he was supposed to steal Cordelia according to the story. According to the story that Evelyn created, she takes Cordelia's place, so the prince has to steal her. Not long before these events, her brother Killian knocked on Evelyn's door at the mansion. Hearing no answer, he entered the room to ask if she had chosen a partner for the ball. His eyes rounded when he didn't see the girl in the room, but he did see the window left wide open. Evelyn woke up with a headache and looked around her and saw the prince's luxurious room. This could mean only one thing, that she had succeeded in her plan. A knight knocked on the door of the room. He already knew Evelyn, but she did not know him. It was he who had taken her to the prince yesterday, or rather stolen her. The knight said that the prince was already waiting for her. He remembered that he hadn't introduced himself and decided to fix it. He was an accompanying knight of Devon Lanthimos named Karen Weibo. Evelyn recognized him by his voice and told him so. He understood his guilt as well as his present guilt, but these were forced measures by order of Prince Lantimos himself, to which the knight could not object. Leaving the luxurious room, Karen's knight led the blonde girl through the house, which was very quiet. There weren't many servants either, considering the size of the estate. Probably everyone was following the heavy and strict rules ordered by the prince. This dead silence was interrupted by the knight. He asked the girl if she knew about the prince's situation, and she replied that it was a well-known story, so she was no exception. There were bad rumors about him, and his accompanying knight knew about them. As Evelyn herself knew, the oracle chose the emperor's successor. The others who were not chosen were cursed, so the prince wanted revenge, and for that reason he got involved with the darkness. To tell the truth, the prince is not such a bad person if you get to know him better. Neither the prince nor his knight were to be feared, even though they had brought Evelyn to the manor in a less than pleasant way. At the table, the prince was the first to speak. He had heard that Evelyn could lift the curse from him, so he wanted to make a deal. The girl could indeed heal him, but she had some conditions. She needed money to leave the empire, and the couch just laughed and commented that he didn't know the goddess would treat him for money. This was not a big problem for the prince, so he accepted the condition. Among the many rumors, there was only one very strange one. People said that Count Diego's adopted daughter could not use her divine powers, so the prince expected rumors to remain rumors. The girl admitted that she does not use her magic powers at will, but it is not important. If the prince does not accept her conditions, she will assume that the conversation about healing never happened. The situation was not easy, so it was not possible to resolve this issue so easily, even if the prince wanted to. Pretending that this conversation never happened was just avoiding the problem. Evelyn had heard many rumors about the Dark Prince. People said that he was a very cruel man, but she was not going to fall for all the manipulations no matter how he threatened her, and she was going to reserve the right to choose how to use her powers. Her interlocutor was a little disappointed that she would react so fearlessly to all the rumors about him, and the situation that remained if she refused was even more unpleasant for the prince. In the end, he agreed to Evelyn's terms and assured her that he would do whatever she wanted to do to break the curse. 
She herself recalled that people said the prince had a terrible temper, but it was true. And most of all, he hated lies. So if it turned out that Evelyn had tried to lie to him about something, it could end her life abruptly. After Evelyn left the room, she was met by one of the maids who introduced herself as Hilda. It was clear she was nervous, as it was her first day in the position, so she promised to do her best. The young maid wanted to help the guest because she thought she was going to go to her room, but Evelyn said she wanted to look around the house, and Hilda felt obliged to accompany her. The guest wanted to look around the apartment to find all the exits just in case, and to make a plan for a possible escape. Asking Hilda how she knew where to go, even though she said it was only her first day in the job, the young maid replied that she had already toured the estate and checked it out. Apparently, she takes her job very seriously. The Dark Prince had strange thoughts that something was wrong with the situation. Even though the seal of the Count's clan symbolizes the sun goddess and this girl smelled like daisies, all the clues pointed to her. But for some reason, the sofa had a strange feeling that he had missed something. On her way down the garden path at the prince's mansion, Evelyn decided to ask the young maid how she came to be employed. Hilda told her that she had heard that the prince's estate was looking for a maid, although no one had worked there before. It was strange that the estate had no servants at all. The maid promised that she would not tell anyone that Evelyn would be the future wife of the prince. This shocked the girl, but she did not ask Hilda about it again so as not to provoke more rumors. The young maid asked Evelyn if the prince was really as bad a man as the rumors said. In fact, the girl did not know the answer to this question because she had just met him today and their conversation had not lasted long, but it might have been true. It had been a busy day yesterday, so Evelyn hadn't realized she had fallen asleep. The young maid Hilda had indeed given her a good tour of the house. Her memories of the day were interrupted by a knock at the door, and it was the prince's servant calling for breakfast. The prince was waiting for her in the dining room. Because she had just woken up and hadn't had time to clean herself up, she refused to sit down and eat breakfast at first, but Devon assured her that her appearance was of no importance. Finally sitting down at the table, the girl said that she had noticed yesterday that there were very few servants in the mansion. Devon disagreed with her words because, besides them, his servant was also present in the room, to the point that he hired another maid personally for Evelyn. She did not complain about the inconvenience, but she was more concerned about the fact that the prince was alone in the house for days, not counting the butler. He replied that he did not like large crowds, and that the more people there were, the harder it was to remember the sound of their footsteps. After that, the room became quiet, so she thought she had said something unnecessary and crossed the line of an already very private prince. He broke the silence when he asked if Evelyn could start the treatment tonight. She had enough divine power to heal him, so she agreed. In the evening, while waiting for Evelyn to arrive in the room, someone began to speak to Devon. The unknown voice thought the whole situation was funny, but the prince ordered him to shut up and leave him alone. The voice wouldn't shut up, claiming that they had known the prince for five years, but he still thought he was just going crazy. His butler told him that he had brought Evelyn to the room so that she could begin to heal the prince. The girl sat down on the couch next to the prince and told him that before healing could begin, it was necessary to create a space that could accommodate the divine power. So today she was to simply give him all her strength and spend the next few days on the treatment itself. There was only one detail that made the blonde girl think. The novel described that Devin could not see anything, so he was constantly hitting objects around him. She was worried that he really couldn't see. Yesterday she noticed that he seemed to see everything, but she wasn't sure. Suddenly, during the healing, Evelyn stopped suddenly. She didn't fully understand what was happening to her because it had never happened before. Something was definitely missing from her ability to use her power, and it was as if this something instantly entered her and she began to behave strangely. Evelyn seemed to be in an unknown dimension, and an unknown voice greeted her. He said that she should not try to understand what was happening around her. He read her thoughts and not only them, but he did not have time to tell her his true identity. Eventually she realized that it was a dream when she saw the ceiling of the luxurious room. Hilda was already standing next to her, worried about the girl's health. Suddenly Evelyn remembered yesterday and his highness, so she asked the young maid what had happened to his treatment. Hilda said that during the healing, Evelyn had fainted, which frightened the maid. 
This meant that Devon was fine, but now she was worried about why she had fainted. Perhaps it was because she hadn't used her divine powers for too long. She didn't know much about the side effects of not using her divine powers often, but she was definitely going to heal the prince's eyes in a few days. As she was getting out of bed, Evelyn heard from her maid that she had heard that they were looking for her in the church. Of course, the Count had already started looking for his missing adopted daughter because she knew too many of his secrets and was a possible future prophet for him. After Evelyn had cleaned herself up, she decided to visit the prince. He was in his study talking to her with the help of a magic tool. In fact, she did not come to him without a reason because she wanted to ask him something. He told her that she had to wait until lunchtime to ask him a question that she wanted to know right now. She then accepted that she would not be able to get the answer she wanted now and would have to wait. If she doesn't find a reason for why she fainted yesterday, there is no guarantee that it won't happen again the next time. This could lead to Devon doubting her and considering her claims that she will cure him a lie. When Evelyn noticed the sword on the prince's shelf, she thought that she could test her divine powers with it. When she asked if she could look at the sword, the prince did not say anything. It was as if he did not hear her, so she took it as a sign of consent. A moment later, the sword was in Evelyn's hands. With one hand, she touched the sharp blade, which injured her hand. The prince quickly jumped up from his chair and approached Evelyn. The girl said that she did not want to get the floor dirty. The couch took the girl's actions as a threat, so he said that she had chosen the wrong target. In fact, he misunderstood the girl. She wanted to test her strength because she had some questions about yesterday's treatment. The injury did indeed disappear in a moment, but it led the girl to a dead end. Evelyn apologized for any displeasure her actions might have caused the prince and mentioned another reason she had come to see him. She also learned that the temple was looking for her, but the prince said he could not let her go until she had removed the curse from him. She did not mean that she wanted him to let her go, but that she did not want to be in that place again. The temple had hardly realized that she was in the prince's house, but now he wondered why she did not want to return. Evelyn did not want to tell the prince the full truth, so she said that after she was healed, she wanted to receive the money that had been promised in the agreement and then leave his house. She preferred to explain it this way to avoid unnecessary questions and problems. The temple had a perfect image in the empire, so it protected it and its owners from unpleasant rumors. Even if she told the truth about what she went through while there, no one would believe her. Adults forced children who had magical powers to heal other people by working without breaks. In addition, they were not fed properly, so they had almost no strength. After an already difficult day, they continued to be abused. No one knew about this side of the temple except the victims themselves. Whatever the beginning, the deal was done. So Evelyn had to do her best to break the curse on Devon and get him to help her leave her empire. That's why no one was to know that Evelyn was hiding here. From the moment the sword fell into the girl's hands and injured her, Devon began to chase her around the house to prevent her from doing something like that again, but she assured him that this was not necessary. The prince could not understand why such a quiet church suddenly began to make noise. He also wondered how Evelyn had learned about it. The girl replied that Hilda had told her. The maids always have the latest rumors. People also said that one of the residents of the church is now in a serious state of illness. The name of this girl was Cordelia. The blonde girl's face instantly turned pale when she heard the name of the real protagonist. She lied about never having heard that name to avoid the topic of her being associated with it. It turns out that Evelyn took away Cordelia's role, so she is still in the temple and continues to be abused. Her illness was probably caused by the fact that she had spent too much energy and reached her limit. In order to restore those with powerful magical powers, you need someone with a similar level of power of their own. Evelyn was perfect for this, so perhaps the temple was looking for her to use to heal Cordelia. Cordelia was much stronger than Evelyn, so the temple would not spare the blonde's strength to restore the source of their status. Evelyn believes she could plot in her favor, but it seems that no matter what she does, she will not be able to change her fate. When she was done thinking about the fact that she could not change her fate, she finally accepted it and went to the room where the prince and his knight were waiting for her. The knight asked her what had happened, and she replied that she missed her home very much. The knight quickly realized that it was time for him to leave, so he left the prince with the girl. Suddenly, Devon started talking about Killian, but the blonde girl quickly changed the subject, saying that it was getting late so they should start healing now. 
Today, she wanted to try to put the divine power into the whole body so the prince didn't have to worry about it because it was safe. He wasn't worried about himself. He was worried about Evelyn because she might faint again like she did yesterday. She denied all of the prince's worries and said that it was probably because she hadn't used her power for a long time, but that she should be fine now. Evelyn reassured herself that everything would work out now because it had happened at the wrong time and place. That voice sounded in her head again, so she quickly pulled her hand away from the prince's. Yesterday she thought that she heard the voice because she had not used her divine powers for a long time, but she was wrong. There was something in Devon's right eye, something that was different from the story that was described in the novel. There were too many strange things, because the blonde girl had fainted during the healing yesterday and still hadn't used her powers today. Most likely it was because she was afraid, but if she was really the girl from the prediction, she shouldn't be afraid of the curse. The oracle sent this curse so that those who were not chosen could not take revenge or rebel against the ruler. For this reason, they spend their whole lives looking for those who can lift the curse, but in the end, when they find them, they continue to live their normal lives. Only Devon and the protagonist, who was trapped in Evelyn's body, knew the contents of this prophecy, so it hasn't raised any suspicions for him until now. She couldn't have fainted again, otherwise it would have raised even more doubts, but her mind was being clouded against her will. Evelyn had already thought about not changing the plot of the book and simply fleeing the Empire. After Killian entered the service of the Imperial Palace, he was free to come and go from the county. This led her to believe that he could help her financially. When asked for money, he replied that if she was going to be in the county all this time, she would have nothing to spend it on. This implied that she was not in the first place in his relationship with Killian, although at first glance it seemed that he was really ready to help her. Killian would never let her leave the county, so her only option was the couch. He was going to steal it, and in exchange for a cure, she would be able to escape. It was a last-ditch effort to stay alive, but she hadn't taken into account that her family was no fools, so her plan backfired when Killian caught her. It was just a stupid dream like all the others, but now it was not a young maid sitting at her bedside but a prince. She noticed this when he suddenly began to speak. He would have been curious what new excuse she would come up with. The girl said that her divine power was lacking something, but the problem was not with the girl herself, but with her patient. Evelyn promised that she would make sure that his left eye would start to see tonight. What she meant was that she would continue to treat him until she knew what was wrong with his right eye. This was the last attempt to check Devon's doubts. If the prince had already begun to suspect her, the fair-haired girl could not sit idly in her room and look for a way to escape. She was helped in this by a young maid who kept Evelyn waiting because of the amount of work she had to do. As the blonde girl approached the gate where the guards were standing, one of them stopped her and told her that she could not go any further. This was not an order from the prince, but they had to follow the established regulations. When Evelyn heard a familiar voice, she looked around and saw Knight Wybo, who had suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It was as if he had been watching her. Deciding to seize the moment, she asked the knight to accompany her on a walk outside the gate. To do so, the knight, Weibo, had to ask the prince's permission, so Evelyn asked one of the guards to go to him and ask for permission. While the guard was returning, she decided to ask the knight if she could address him by his first name, and based on his permission, she allowed herself to be called by his first name as well. The guard came back very quickly and told Evelyn and Knight Weibo that His Highness had given his permission for Knight Weibo to escort the girl off the estate. Evelyn was about to warn Hilda, but realized that she had escaped only now. Outside the castle, she learned that it was surrounded by a river, so the only way to get out was over a bridge. Compared to the size of the castle itself, there were few guards. Evelyn's current problem was only Karen Weibo. Weibo's family was a well-known knightly clan, so it followed that he was probably a very strong knight. If she tried to run away, he would capture her immediately, so she had to be very careful now. Deciding to start from the very end, the girl asked if the knight had ever been outside the empire. He answered that he had to leave the empire because of military campaigns, and before he came here, he served in the border knightly order. Evelyn admitted that she had never left the county and was asked if Karen had been to the north in the city of Elian. The protagonist accidentally read about Elian in a book when she was looking for a place to escape, so they tried to get as much information about it as possible. 
Karen had been there, but he admitted that it snows all year round in Elian, so it was difficult to live there and to move around. It was as if Evelyn was able to get her interlocutor talking. Thanks to Karina's endless chatter, she was convinced that Elian was just right to stay there, at least for the time being. The garden, to Evelyn's surprise, looked very nice. It really looked like it had been regularly and well-maintained. These words made Karen laugh a little, and he said that the garden was entirely the soldier's fault, because before them, it looked ridiculous. For a long time, the soldiers had nothing to do, so this garden became their main occupation out of boredom. There were no problems for a long time, and His Highness was not interested in the throne or politics at all. When Evelyn met him personally, she found out that all the rumors were lies and that the prince had no interest in palace affairs. The couch only wanted to break the curse and go on living his normal quiet life in his estate. To the blonde girl, it reminded her a little bit of herself, but a protagonist and a secondary character cannot be alike. At the house, Evelyn sat next to the prince and was about to begin healing. She was not at all confident in her powers, but she said otherwise. She could have lost consciousness during the treatment, but the divine powers would still reach her patient. It was the last time, and this time it was all right. Evelyn gave him the divine power, but only through her left hand, and she did not have that strange feeling. It seems that she was losing her consciousness because of the aura coming from the right side of the prince's body. The same aura again began to capture her divine power. This energy was dark, but she was able to overcome it. It was very hard for Evelyn, but she was able to finish the healing and told the prince not to open his eyes right away. She kept her promise, so she expected the same from Devon. His Highness agreed to this and asked if the payment would be in cash or precious stones. She was unsure about the amount of money she would need to leave the empire. Suddenly, the prince asked the girl what she looked like, which was a bit of an unexpected question, so he decided to ask the same question to his butler, who had just entered the room. The butler described Evelyn as a girl with green and yellow hair like flower petals and blue eyes like the sea. The brooch left by the queen would have been a perfect match for them. The brooch looked very expensive, but Devon assured her that he would give her some gold to take with her before she left. As Evelyn was about to leave, Hilda came up to her and asked her where she got the money. The bag contained about enough money for the young maid's family to live on for three months. Evelyn did not remember exactly how many people were in her family, but eventually she estimated that there were four of them together. Evelyn had enough money to last an average peasant family for three months, but she was more concerned about whether she could heal Devon. There was no telling when the temple would come for her, so it would be best to go to Elian right now while Devon still trusted her. If she didn't completely destroy the curse and escape, there was no telling what would happen to Devon's eyes, and that scared her a little. The door to Evelyn's room was open, so she assumed that Hilda had forgotten to close it again. Looking out into the long, dark corridor, the blonde girl did not see the maid, but heard the sound of unknown footsteps that quickly disappeared behind one of the doors. As Evelyn walked through the garden with Karen, she noticed a wall that she thought could be easily climbed down. Judging by the large puffs of smoke in its location, it was the kitchen. She decided to check her guesses and went inside. The kitchen was very noisy, and the cooks were working quickly while their chef gave orders. She explained her sudden visit by saying that she was just looking around the castle. The large number of people was due to the fact that His Highness is a true gourmet, so he has quite a few servants in the kitchen, unlike other parts of the castle. As strange rumors were circulating about her and Devon, when asked about the prince's favorite food, Chef reacted very strongly. She said that he liked fresh salads and undercooked meat. She also suggested that the girl was interested in this because she was the future mistress of the castle. The only door to the kitchen was always closed at 11 in the evening when the cooks finished their work. Even if the girl was hungry after that time, she would not be able to enter the kitchen unnoticed, but the chef assured her that she could ask the butler. The butler had all the keys to the castle, so it would be even harder for her to climb down the wall, but she had to do it to avoid dying. She checked almost all the ways to escape, and if she was lucky and could heal the prince's right eye, she wouldn't need them. Suddenly, on her way from the kitchen to her room, Evelyn met Devon. She was very frightened of him because she had never seen him walking around the kitchen before. In shock, she accidentally stumbled and almost fell, but the prince reacted quickly and saved her from falling. 
Yevelyn apologized for her carelessness, and Devin was surprised to hear her voice because he still didn't understand who had been so careless walking around his house. It was a good coincidence that he met her now because he wanted to talk to her. The prince said that he had missed something in yesterday's conversation and was on his way to find Evelyn. Her brother, Killian Diego, had asked him for an audience. He had no way of knowing that she was here now, so it probably had nothing to do with the girl. The prince had heard that the blonde girl was close to her brother, so he allowed her to look at him from afar. Evelyn already knew that Killian was going to catch her, but she did not understand how he knew where she was. Killian was the head of the guard of the prince's sister, so it was not surprising that he decided to visit him. The couch could not refuse this meeting because if he did not receive the knight, he might be suspected of preparing a rebellion against the crown princess. Killian was due to arrive tomorrow, so she decided to try to heal the prince's right eye today. Devon wanted to get rid of the curse as soon as possible so he could not refuse this healing. They agreed to meet in the evening. Evelyn wondered whether the Earl knew about this or whether it was Killian's own initiative, but she was more concerned that if she was caught again, she would be imprisoned. She had already begun to think about persuading Killian to run away with her, but he would not agree, and Evelyn herself did not want to live with him for the rest of her life. She had to leave this place before he got here. A knight like Karen could easily apprehend her and turn her over to the prince, so slipping past him would not be easy. She already had a plan, namely Evelyn was to steal the keys from the kitchen, jump out the window, climb down the wall, climb over the fence, cross the bridge, and then head for the border but she didn't know if she could execute it. The blonde girl's thoughts were interrupted by a young maid who quietly approached her. The protagonist always had a strange feeling next to Hilda. She missed the moment when Hilda stopped being afraid of her and stuttered. Hilda herself said that it was only her first day, but even then she knew the location of all the rooms in the castle. In addition, she very quickly heard rumors from the temple, which was no less surprising. Was she really just an ordinary maid? Evelyn's guess was right, and Hilda, or what was behind her face, was an extraordinary maid. Her expression changed dramatically, and she began to recall some of the moments from Evelyn's childhood. Hilda said that she had no other way but to stay close to Evelyn. Karen was supposed to be watching the blonde girl. She was supposed to call him, but it was too risky, and Hilda herself would not have allowed her to do so. After Hilda's words that it would be best to erase the situation from Evelyn's memory, the protagonist really forgot about it all. Evelyn felt as if something had disappeared from her mind, but she did not understand what it was. Hilda asked her if she liked daisies, and she replied that she didn't really like them. If you look closely, there were daisies all over the castle, most likely planted on purpose. The prince was already waiting for Evelyn in the room. The prince told her that the doctor had assured him that the curse was gone, but that it would take a few days for him to see without problems. Today, Evelyn was going to heal his left eye, and after that he would be able to regain his sight completely. Ever since the blonde girl began to heal Devon's left eye, he no longer doubted her abilities. They were going to elope if she failed to heal his right eye, but now, seeing how much he trusts her, she feels guilty towards him. No matter how hard she tried, the strange voice she had heard while I was unconscious was still there. It was no ordinary curse, and it made her doubt whether she would be able to break it at all. Such a powerful force could, on the contrary, absorb Evelyn's divine power. The voice suggested that she trust it and it would take away her divine power, from which she had suffered so much. This would make her life much easier, but she still hesitated. The voice grew louder and louder and thus more convincing. Her physical body remained relaxed while her mind was in an unknown city. She still didn't understand why she was trying so desperately to stay alive, but remembering her future freedom and her desire to go to Elian, she returned to her physical body. This loud and persuasive voice almost made her take the path of certain death. Now she relied only on her thoughts and decided to do her best to heal the prince. Of course, the unknown being did not like this, so it drained all of Evelyn's divine powers, and she lost consciousness. This was the last attempt, and Evelyn realized that the prince would not give her permission for more. She had lost to this creature of mine, who was too strong even for her divine powers, which she had saved for this very purpose, so she had to flee now. As planned, Evelyn ran to the kitchen. At first she thought the door was closed, but the handle turned easily allowing her to enter the kitchen. There was no time to think, so she decided that she had been fooled at first. 
When she saw the window, she quickly jumped through it and began to climb down. The wall was quite steep, but it was not difficult to climb. Even though Evelyn had a hard life, she had never climbed a wall before, and surprisingly, it didn't seem that hard. Suddenly, one of the girl's feet slipped off the brick and she started to fall to the ground. From this height, she should have hit hard, but the landing was quite soft. The girl decided to attribute all her luck to a simple coincidence. She stopped thinking it was a coincidence when an unknown force, which looked like a dark aura in Devon's right eye, helped her drive the guards away from the gate. In front of the gate, she saw a barrier of a rather high level, but with her power, she was able to cross it. Evelyn looked over and saw a light burning in the window of Devon's room. She was really sorry to leave him so easily, but if everything had gone according to the plot of the novel, he would have met Cordelia and been freed from the curse. Evelyn herself changed their fates. Suddenly, she noticed that she had lost her locket, but maybe it was for the best she no longer had any reason to smell daisies for the sake of the couch. This place would now remain only in her memories and possible dreams. On her way out of the castle, the fair-haired girl heard the sound of horses' hooves coming toward her. Killian and the rest of his knights were approaching the castle. He wasn't supposed to arrive until tomorrow, so Evelyn was surprised and hid among the trees as quickly as possible. Evelyn's legs were running on their own. She kept thinking that she just had to run. It didn't matter where she went as long as she got as far away as possible. Pushing aside the leaves of the trees in front of her, she opened up a view of a magical sunrise that would take her to a place where no one could find her. The curse was broken, but the prince could not wake up. He was woken up by a noise around him, Karen's voice talking to a doctor who was trying to explain that Devon's case was very rare. Eventually, the man got out of bed. The butler eventually explained that on the day Evelyn treated Devon's eye, they both fainted. So the butler called a doctor and a priest. The latter assured him that the curse had been broken, but the prince did not regain consciousness for a long time after that. In addition, Evelyn also disappeared, or to be more precise, she ran away. Even though the prince refused to believe that the girl was capable of such a thing, all the signs pointed to it. Fate was on her side, so all the obstacles that Devon had tried so hard to create were overcome by chance. Devon said that as soon as he was back to normal, the first thing he would do was to change the security. The butler also handed his highness a locket that had been found on the day Evelyn disappeared. It smelled of daisies, just like the blonde girl. The medallion itself looked like a magical object, but not dangerous. Devon's permission was required for more research. But he decided to leave it at that, because Evelyn had fulfilled her promise and lifted the curse. And the prince had no reason to pursue her further. His eyesight could be restored in a few days if he started intensive vision training right away. All this time, the wizards maintained the amount of vitamins and nutrients in the prince's body, but he still needed to return to his normal state because he had been unconscious for about a year. It was quite loud in the kitchen because the prince was to take off his bandage today. One of the maids was afraid that the prince would feel sick when he heard that he had been unconscious for a year. Their chatter was interrupted by the chef, who ordered them to work even harder because they needed to feed Devon well so that he would regain his strength as soon as possible. One of them kept asking if Evelyn would return, but the chief did not know this either. After the prince lost consciousness, Evelyn concealed her whereabouts all this time. The maids missed Evelyn very much, because she ate everything they cooked, leaving only clean plates behind. The time came for her prince to remove the blindfold from his eyes. Everyone was still under the impression, but he asked them to leave the room to be with his doctor. His eyes opened wide when he took off the blindfold, but his right eye was still blurry. According to Evelyn, she was going to leave the Empire when their agreement was finalized, and most likely she did just that. All the servants knew that the prince's right eye was still sore, which meant that the rumors would quickly reach the capital. The prince quickly returned to normal, so he was able to continue his normal activities without having to spend about a year in bed. During this time, it seemed to Devon that Karen had weakened. But he said that this was only by the standards of the prince himself. The knight and his majesty hadn't had a sword fight in a long time, so the former still couldn't believe that Devon had regained consciousness. Although the prince's right eye was not seeing clearly, it did not cause him any inconvenience in his daily life. He was glad that he no longer heard that strange voice and no longer had to listen to the sound of footsteps. 
It seemed very strange that despite the curse being gone, his eyes still had poor vision. The prince was suddenly called by the butler, who said that the analysis of the medallion was completed. It contained no magical powers, only a liquid that had the scent of chamomile. It was not known how Evelyn knew about the prediction, but it was known that she had deceived him. The rumors of the Dark Prince's healing have reached the islands, so judging by the letter they recently sent, they have been waiting for this moment since His Highness collapsed a year ago. Devon asked his butler to write the letter for him, but the butler said that if the princess found out about it, the prince would not hear anything good from her. The princess had never visited Devon when he had been unconscious for a year, so he did not care what she thought of him now. Evelyn most likely ran away because she knew she couldn't fully heal the prince, but he wanted to find her anyway because he thought she had another reason. It seemed to him that her brother Killian Diego might know where this fraudster was, so the prince accepted his request for an audience in his castle. Killian tried to start from the end by congratulating the prince on his healing and deliverance from the curse. The guest ignored the prince's questions about what he had to do with his healing, but his main words slipped out of his head when he saw the medallion he had given to his sister long before. Most likely, Killian came here to look for his sister, not to ask about something important. Perhaps he was worried about his missing sister, so he searched for her wherever he could. And the prince's estate was no exception. However, the prince did not understand why he had asked for an audience a few days after hearing about what was happening in such a quiet castle of Devon. Killian quickly got up from the chair he was sitting on and began to ask the prince about Evelyn's whereabouts. He believed that she was in Devon's room or hidden somewhere in the house. He had to find her, even if it meant losing his life. The prince allowed him to search his house even if Killian had to turn the place upside down, but he had a week to do so. If he doesn't find Evelyn, he has to say goodbye to his life. The relationship between Count Diego's children seemed incredibly strong, as Knight Killian entered every room and checked every corner. One had the feeling that he was not looking for his sister, but for his beloved. In one of the rooms of the castle, there was a crumpled blanket on the bed as if someone was hiding under it, but unfortunately, Evelyn was not there. Meanwhile, Evelyn, who was no longer Evelyn, started a new life in Snowy Elian with a new name, Leah. For the past few months, she had been constantly worried that someone would come for her, but the information from other countries was not well received in this snowy region, so no one came here and the days were rather quiet. The people of Eliuna did not know Leah's real story because she made up a story that she came here because she had lost her entire family. The man from whom she always bought meat felt sad every time she told him this story, so he gave her a discount. Walking along a road through the forest, which she had decided to take as a shortcut home because of her heavy burden, she encountered a monster. There were many legends about the danger of Eliana, but the blonde girl did not think they were true. A giant monster that looked like a green fox grabbed the girl and tried to eat her. She had had such a hard time getting out of the circumstances of the story, so she couldn't die so senselessly. The girl began to scream for someone to save her, but her cries were heard. Devon saved her from falling. She was so shocked that she was found so quickly, and that the incarnation still did not affect the prince's right eye, so she could not say a word. The prince guessed that the blonde girl was not the girl from the prediction because he found her locket. He didn't know how she knew the contents of the prediction, but he knew she was very good at playing the fraud. Despite the couch's accusations that she was to blame for the house's failure to fully heal him, Evelyn worried that his right eye was completely unable to see, but he quickly contradicted her words. She knew from the beginning that she would not be able to heal the prince completely, but even the girl with the foresight would probably not have been able to do so, because there was something in the eye besides the curse itself. Evelyn didn't know how to get rid of it, so she didn't do it. The prince took advantage of the right moment and the reduced distance between them to take a closer look at the girl's face and hair, and the butler's words were true, for Evelyn had golden hair and blue eyes. All this time, the girl had been pretending to be the girl from the vision, so at least for that she had to be punished, even though she had not fulfilled the terms of the agreement, so the prince had no choice but to marry her. While Evelyn was packing up her belongings from her home with Elian, the prince informed her that the brooch Devon had given her had magic on it that allowed her to track her location. There was no need to destroy it, as it would come in handy again and again. 
The girl did not think she was leaving her home in Eliunu forever, so she packed a minimum of her belongings. Devon told her that she was not coming back here, so she had to take absolutely all her things. She didn't want to marry the prince, but he started manipulating her into getting stuck in the forest with the monster again. Eventually, she found herself in the carriage that was taking her and the prince to the castle. She asked the prince why he was talking about marriage so suddenly, since a whole year had passed and he should have forgotten about the situation, but he did not give a clear answer, so she decided to change the subject. He wondered why she had not sold the brooch he had used to track her down. Evelyn replied that she could not sell such an important and valuable brooch because it had previously belonged to the empress. Returning to the topic of marriage, the prince replied that only Evelyn was able to break the curse with that girl with the foresight, so there had to be a connection. None of the other doctors, magicians, and priests could heal his eye, so the last hope was for the girl. The girl decided to tell us that during her last treatment, she had talked to a dark creature that prevented the prince's right eye from healing. She didn't remember the exact words, but it definitely didn't say goodbye. For some reason, this being was interested in Evelyn and had no intention of harming her. It could have been anything that was taller than a human, so one assumption was that the creature was a deity. But with skills like Evelyn's, she would have likely been able to recognize it. Evelyn had few memories of the creature, but she did remember that it had an unpleasant laugh. This led Devon to find similarities between their imaginary guests because it was possible that this creature was familiar to him. Finally, the carriage arrived at the castle, and Evelyn was greeted by Hilda, who missed her dearly. She could not remember if she had ever been so close to the young maid before, but she was glad to be expected. In addition to Hilda, Evelyn also met the knight Karen, who did not expect that the girl had such skills that she easily climbed down such a high wall and overcame the barrier. His armor became many times thicker, most likely due to the fact that he was severely punished for her escape. Thanks to the girl, he now got up at dawn and trained with the other guards, and the castle itself had significantly increased security, as it was now manned around the clock. Now they slept three hours a day, but their day became much more disciplined. Their conversation was interrupted by the prince, who asked them to end it quickly and go inside the castle. Once inside the castle, Evelyn finally sat down, although she was afraid of getting the chairs dirty because she thought her dress was too dirty. Elian was not famous for its good facilities but only for its views of nature, so there was no reason to be surprised at the girl's appearance. She was presented with a document that was for the conclusion of their marriage, as the prince had assured her. Evelyn was very surprised and left her chair because she had not given her consent to this engagement. It was not in her interest to come here, but she could not jump out of the carriage on the way. The prince realized that she wanted to escape the empire, and he even knew the reason why. The butler told Devon that on the day Evelyn arrived at the apartment, he found bruises on her target, so it was easy to understand that Count Diego had abused her, and Killian, although he was obsessed with her, could not help. Killian Diego was now inside the house. It had been a year since Evelyn had disappeared from the Count's house, and her brother had been searching for her. That was the reason why Devon had asked her to marry him, because if she agreed, neither the gambler nor her brother would be able to get close to the girl anymore. He could guarantee her complete safety until she found out how to heal his right eye, and then she could leave the Empire, as they had originally agreed. In their case, marriage was the most reliable and logical solution. It would be strange if Evelyn stayed here for no reason, and in the case of marriage, she would definitely not be able to escape. Finding a real healer from the foresight would have taken some time, so the prince had to wait for his healing. In any case, he already knew Evelyn, so that was the logical reason why he trusted her more than an unknown healer. The illogical reason was that he wanted to try her again and see what would happen. It seemed like a good offer, even if Evelyn escaped again. There was no telling when she would be captured again. But when she became a duchess, she wouldn't have to worry about that. Moreover, she wondered why she remembered what had happened in her past life and wondered what kind of dark force it was. Devon had a terrible temper, so he didn't even tell the girl that he had been unconscious for a year, but most likely he just didn't want to burden Evelyn. When she found out, she started blaming herself. Even after that, he wants to experience it again. It was hard to think consciously because my feelings were taking over. If you look at him as a groom, he had good looks, status, and financial situation. But the only thing that spoiled this beautiful picture was his terrible character. 
Thinking back to the monster in the forest the day Evelyn went back to the prince's castle, she remembered that the animal had a crystal in its forehead, which meant that the monster was brought from the temple. Most likely the temple needed the girl's body to heal Cordelia. The whole situation looked strange. Even the temple and Killian still hadn't forgotten about Evelyn's existence, even though a year had passed. The girl was tired of this danger and eternal hiding, so she decided to put an end to it. Hilda suddenly and quietly entered the room where Evelyn was sitting. She had a similar feeling that something like this had happened before. The young maid had a lot to tell Evelyn during her absence, so she began to hurry Evelyn along. Tonight was the night of the ball, for which the maid had already prepared the girl's dress. Rumors of the prince's wedding had already spread everywhere, even though Evelyn had not yet given her consent. This dress was chosen by the prince himself, so Evelyn had a matching brooch with an identical gemstone color. Hilda continued to chatter on and on, telling the girl everything that had happened in the last year at the manor. During this year, Evelyn had forgotten how talkative her maid was. After stopping this flow of information, she asked Hilda if she had heard that Evelyn's brother was now in the duchy. Of course, the maid knew about this information, so Evelyn asked about Killian's conversation with the prince. Hilda's strange behavior was compounded by words that the Hilda she knew would not have said. The maid asked what she would get in return for telling what the two had talked about. The situation quickly changed when Hilda revealed her true identity. In fact, Hilda was still Hilda, but her body now belonged to a dark creature who reported that she could see things that Evelyn could not while looking at the door. This information disappeared from the blonde girl's mind again, along with the pain, and she began to suspect something, because it all happened after the conversation with the young maid. Evelyn also felt as if something had suddenly disappeared from her memories. At sunset, Evelyn put on her dress and went outside. She was suddenly called out by a prince who was dressed in similar clothes. This was the whole ball for which Hilda was preparing the girl. Suddenly Devon called out to Killian, who came out from the side of the beautiful garden. It had been exactly a week since they had made a deal that Evelyn's brother had to find her within a week, or else he would have to say goodbye to his life. The girl had agreed to the marriage anyway, but the prince thought it would be better to show a little performance to her crazy brother first. Although it made a lot of logical sense and was absolutely necessary, it was entertaining, so Devon should not miss this opportunity to have fun. Evelyn was used to faking her emotions, so she decided to play along with the prince. She began to pretend that she really wanted the marriage to take place as soon as possible, so the situation began to escalate in Killian's eyes, and the prince was pleased. Killian thought that all this time where he had been hiding the girl on his territory, but they had an agreement that Evelyn's brother had not fulfilled. Rules were rules, Killian had a week to do it, his sister was found by Devon so the knight was defeated. Deciding that she would not wait another minute for Annie, Evelyn took matters into her own hands and walked closer to where the marriage contract was located and sealed it with her own blood. Her marriage to Devon was now considered valid and she could not dissolve it unless she entered into a new contract through blood. Their marriage was also confirmed by a witness who acted as a witness. The events that had taken place before Killian's eyes still did not fit in his head. He could not accept the fact that Evelyn was now married. He asked to talk to her, but she refused. Killian never showed his true self in public, but this time he was really shocked. The prince grabbed his hand and noticed that Evelyn did not want to hear Killian. The boy had to hear at least his highness's words, but he was still in a state of shock. So he began to beg Devon to return Evelyn to him. After all the rejections from the prince and Evelyn herself, the boy could no longer find the right words. So he decided to give up. He quickly hid behind one of the corners of the prince's mansion, but Evelyn still thought it was too suspicious. Today was a long and difficult day for the duchess. First, she had to think about and make her decision about the marriage contract. Then Killian came to the ball and put on a show, and then the butler made her learn her duties as a duchess. She had not yet accepted the fact that she was married, which meant that she had to prepare for the wedding ceremony. She also had to solve all the problems with the temple and report them to Devon. On the way to her room, she thought about it all and couldn't believe that Killian had given up so easily. Her unnecessary worries about Killian's easy acceptance of the situation were true. When she entered her room, he was already waiting for her. He offered to return to Duke Diego's estate and continue living his normal life. Evelyn did not consider that cellar her home, where she spent most of her childhood. 
She realized that if she returned, the Count would again ban her from that basement without the right to freedom. He had promised for years that he would save her, but he hadn't done it and he wouldn't do it this time either, so she couldn't believe his words. All this time he had just stood by and watched, pretending not to notice, but now Evelyn was an adult so she didn't need his help anymore. She could no longer hear what her crazy and obsessed brother was saying, so she hurried out of her room, leaving the intruder alone. Evelyn asked him to leave her room as quickly as possible and as quietly as possible so that no one would hear him. Once she was on the other side of the door, Evelyn ran quickly down the long corridor to one of the rooms in the castle that was as far away from hers as possible. She didn't keep track of how long she waited for Killian to leave her room, but she was worried the whole time that he was still there. She was afraid that if she left the room, she would run into Killian again, so she decided to wait a little longer. While Evelyn was sleeping, a young maid came to visit her, but she was half asleep and could not answer, so Hilda sat down next to her and told her not to worry about anything. The next morning, she woke up on the couch. The butler who had been attending to her said that he had not woken her up because she was sound asleep, but asked her why she had decided to spend the rest of the night on this couch instead of in a comfortable bed. Evelyn said that she had been so tired last night that she didn't even realize she had fallen asleep. Butler was surprised to see her covered with a blanket this morning. The girl thinks that Hilda was asleep right away, and it was probably her who carried Evelyn to the couch and covered her with a blanket. The protagonist was supposed to thank her when she met her and possibly give her a gift. Deciding to ask the butler if he knew Hilda's whereabouts, since she had been with the girl all night and had probably not slept well, the Duchess wanted to thank her and let her go for one day. The man in front of her had no idea what she was talking about, because he didn't know who Hilda was. This was simply not possible, as there was no sign of Hilda in the maid's room. Evelyn assumed that Hilda had given a false name, so she asked where the maid who had lived in the room had gone, but the butler said that no one had used it for a long time. Suddenly the man remembered that a maid had lived in this room about a year ago, and he snapped his fingers. It worked on Evelyn, and she began to gradually remember the day she sat in front of the daisies, and for the first time she doubted Hilda and their conversation with the maid yesterday. When he asked the knight Karen about Hilda, he also could not recall the existence of such a maid in their castle. Hilda definitely existed, but no one remembered her. It was similar to the way Evelyn's memories had disappeared, and perhaps Hilda was involved. Evelyn decided to ask Devon about this question, because she believed that Hilda might be a supernatural being or that something had entered her body to control her. It was as if this being had created Hilda's body from the beginning. She decided not to talk about the incident with Killian, as it was not related to the current topic of the disappearance of one of the maids, and she wanted to resolve this issue without Devon's knowledge, as it concerned only her and her brother. The prince may have known this unknown being. About seven years ago, at first he heard a nasty laugh in his head, and then he began to recognize objects around him even though he could not see them. It was always talking to Devon and laughing, but after healing it stopped. The girl learned that she had thought that during her escape, it was this force that helped her climb down the wall and overcome the barrier, but after that it disappeared. It turned out that this power penetrates its target through the eye and creates all the conditions under which it can interact with the physical body and then disappears without a trace. If this creature was indeed a deity, then Devon had no choice but to fight it. Evelyn didn't think it was the right thing to do, but the prince saw no other way to solve the problem with his eye since it was unlikely to talk. Evelyn didn't know for sure, but she felt that this creature did not have an evil aura, and its actions were aimed at helping her physical body because it helped Devon to distinguish objects and the girl to escape from the castle. They did not have time to sit around and do nothing, so the prince wanted to ask the creature whether it had evil intentions or not in person. First, they had to go to the temple and have a wedding ceremony, because they were married according to the documents from yesterday, but the girl did not want to go to the temple right now. This event was mandatory because the main goal was to let as many people as possible know about their wedding. It was completely lost on them that the priest from the church had recently been looking for Evelyn, but now that she was a duchess, he had to guarantee her complete safety. Even if they were looking for her in the temple, no one would dare to keep her there against her will. The temple was a crueler place than Devon had ever imagined. 
Suddenly, Evelyn remembered a monster in the forest, with a white crystal in its forehead, which meant that it belonged to the temple. The girl said that these crystals belonged to a shelter on the temple grounds. She had grown up in one of them, but she was not the only one in Volodya who had magical powers. The temple workers extracted these magical powers from the children and placed them in white crystals that resembled magic crystals. Usually, the children did not die when their powers were taken away, but were completely devastated, as if they had no soul. The prince promised to send Karen to Elian to find either the monster or what was left of it. If Karen finds no trace of it, it will mean that someone from the temple took care of it. Devon didn't have full faith in Evelyn, but if the temple was involved, he was in trouble. As the ceremonies were in full swing, a woman came to Evelyn to take care of her appearance at the wedding. Eventually, Devon declared that the wedding would take place in the temple and sent the Ghanaians to the empire. He thought it would make the temple people even more angry that they could not do anything for Evelyn, even though she was so close. After that, he dumped all the preparations on Evelyn's shoulders, making the excuse that he was busy. The woman who was doing the girl's hair looked out the window and saw Karen, who had already returned from Elliot. Without waiting for the woman to finish her hair, Evelyn quickly jumped out of her chair and ran to the door. Quickly bursting into Karen's room, the girl began to ask him about his trip to Elion. The knight was very surprised by the blonde girl's strong reaction, so he assumed that she was in love with him. All of his assumptions were interrupted by the butler, who addressed Evelyn as Duchess. The man asked to behave appropriately with her highness in order not to be reprimanded or punished. It was very strange that Karen didn't know anything about Devon and Evelyn's wedding, since there were so many rumors around the castle. He had been busy with work all this time, so now was a good time to catch up on everything he had missed, so he started asking around about where and when the ceremony would take place. All this meaningless talk was really annoying the prince, so he decided to come to the point. Karen went to all the trade guilds, but he could not find anything, which meant that the temple had already been covered up. However, he could not say that he came up empty-handed because he was lucky enough to meet a witness. According to his words, he saw someone walking near the already dead monster and this unknown person was wearing a white cloak. There was also something strange. Before they disappeared, a dark smoke appeared around them and according to the witness, it looked like dark magic. Devon also overheard Karan's conversation with Evelyn and he said that dark magic had long since disappeared from this world, so the witness was lying. This was... The novel said nothing about dark magic, so Evelyn decided to ask. The knight told her that, unlike divine or magical powers, little was known about dark magic. All that was known was that dark magic was the magical power that arises after a contract with a demon. Karen's story was also joined by the prince, who said that demons did not exist. The source of divine power was God, and the source of magical power was nature, so this power belonged to some other being about whom little was known. Evelyn had missed that the power that helped her and Devon could be that being that no one knew anything about until now. They now had a plan to find at least some information about this creature, so Devon was to work on inviting wizards to learn more about the dark force. Evelyn was to try to find clues in ancient manuscripts, and Karen was to go back to Elian and try to find other clues. Flipping through the pages far into the first book she had in her hands today, she still could not find the information she needed. There was too little in the books. In all the years that the main character had spent in the temple, she had never heard of dark magic. This could only mean that the topic of dark magic was kept in the strictest confidence. A new maid named Eunice entered the room where the ancient books were carelessly scattered. She apologized to Evelyn because she was supposed to have cleaned the room earlier. Deciding to take advantage of what information the new maid might have, the blonde asked her if she knew of a possible library or bookstore in the duchy. The maid said that there was a bookstore, but she was not sure if they would have what Evelyn was looking for as they sold mostly novels. Still, it was hard to get information in the duchy, so Evelyn had to go to the empire. The capital had the largest library, and it was most likely that she would find the book she was looking for there. In the capital, Evelyn had to face the people from the temple, but first she had to find some information about dark magic. In addition, she still had one more task. Judging by the fact that the temple is still looking for the blonde girl, Cordelia is still there, so the Duchess had to deal with that as well. 
Suddenly, the blonde girl heard Devin's familiar voice behind her, saying that it was a little strange that Evelyn had suggested going to the Capitol first. He helped her put her luggage into the carriage and told her that the day of the wedding ceremony had already been set for next month. The girl suddenly asked if the prince could find Cordelia in the Capitol, to which he replied that it would not be difficult to try. But he was curious to know the reason for their meeting with Evelyn. They were not friends, but the blonde girl felt guilty about her illness, so she would like to try to help her. Of course, the abuse of the temple was not Evelyn's fault, but she felt guilty not because of that, but because she took her place. If everything had gone according to the story, the real protagonist of the book would be here now, smiling cheerfully. The prince decided to share something personal and break the awkward atmosphere between them, so he said that once, ten years ago, when he was cursed, he woke up and saw absolutely nothing. At first he blamed his sister for all this, because if she had not had the imperial mark, or if she had not been born at all, then Devon would have been the only heir to the throne. After that, Devon began to blame everyone, including the emperor, God, whom he had never seen, and eventually came to the point where he began to blame himself. He knew exactly what the phrase, blame yourself, meant, so he could not order Evelyn to stop doing it because he fully understood her situation. He only warned her not to go too far. She was to think only as much as she could handle. The prince also said that they would stay after sunset in the next village for the night. There were still a few hours left before arrival, so Evelyn had little time to get some sleep. Devon's words were still on her mind. He had said that the best thing to do would be to find a solution to the problem, not to keep looking for her fault, so she wanted his words to be useful to her. If she rescues Cordelia and destroys the temple, the plot of the novel will return to normal and she and Devon will be able to meet, after which he will be completely healed. In the end, they were to fall in love, as described in the novel, and Evelyn was to quietly disappear as if she had never been there. The girl heard signs of danger, so she hurried to save Devon from the carriage glass that broke when the carriage turned over and flew toward them. She was able to save Devon and herself, but she felt some pain in her head afterwards. She claimed that everything was normal because she was very worried about Devon. He wondered what had happened outside and why the carriage had turned over, so he opened the door and got out. His expression changed to a frightened one because he saw several unknown creatures standing in front of him. The monsters looked very frightening indeed. Their bodies were so huge that it was surprising that the knights could not see them coming towards the carriage. The prince missed that it was most likely magic, so he was already trying to plan their next steps, since they still had to get out and get to a nearby settlement. He asked the knights if they were all safe because they were dirty, but they assured him that only the carriages were damaged, but all the people were safe. There was one very strange detail of these wonderful people. After they had smashed only a few carriages, they did nothing else, standing still. That allowed the traveler to quietly leave and hide. In fact, the monsters were not just standing there, they seemed to be looking for something. A moment later, Devon noticed the white crystal Evelyn had mentioned in the eye of one of them. This suggested that these monsters were connected to the temple. The man was so absorbed in the purpose of this obstacle that he did not even notice Evelyn leave the carriage. This only meant that they were now in even greater danger. The monsters reacted quickly to the girl and rushed toward her. Fortunately, Devon managed to grab her and block their field of vision, which included Evelyn. They had a goal, so they tried to destroy everything that was an obstacle to their ability to capture Evelyn. But Devon was also in a hurry to get away from them. In fact, the decision to flee made no sense, so His Highness decided to get rid of them along with the knights. He hoped that Karen's help would not be needed. She wanted to make sure that Devon was okay, as the monster looked very large and most likely had a lot of power, but now they had no other choice. He also claimed that such monsters usually belong to the stupid, so he assumed that they would be able to easily deal with these two. While the rest of the knights were trying to neutralize the enemies, Evelyn noticed Eunice, whose leg was injured. Evelyn offered her help and wanted to heal her with magic. She was very worried because she hadn't used her magic power since the last time she had treated Devon. She thought that she had lost too much power when she fought that dark creature, but fortunately, the divine power continued to be hers. 
It was strange, because she had a strange feeling. The prince and his knights had this feeling as well. The monsters around them seemed not only not to fall, but not to feel pain, so it became much more and much more difficult to fight them. The prince understood that such creatures must have felt pain, but he assumed that their power lay in that white crystal, so he ordered all the knights to get the white crystal, since it was his weak point. He realized that if he took the crystals, he could use them as evidence against the temple. He told all the knights to get ready, and in a moment he would give them a sign that would launch a massive attack on the monsters. Suddenly, one of them stopped and raised his head to the sky as if looking at something. This surprised Devon and the knights, for they did not understand what the next step of these two would be. Suddenly, a huge dragon appeared above them all, bringing with it a huge shadow. One of the monsters was looking at him. Evelyn, like the others, did not understand why the dragon had appeared so suddenly. After that, she missed that he was most likely following her as well. If her hunch was right, then Eunost, who was now at her side, might be hurt. She pushed her away as the dragon approached them. He flew quickly and swiftly to the girl and almost hurt her. But Devon was in front of her, and he put his back to the dragon so that it could hurt him instead of Evelyn. They had no time, but the prince was beginning to lose consciousness because of fatigue and a large and deep wound on his back. Evelyn realized that Dee was losing a lot of blood because of this wound, so she decided to use her divine powers to heal it quickly. She was wrong, and although this power was enough for Eunice, it was too weak for Devon. She wondered why this was happening to her at such times. With such a reserve of divine power to heal, where it is too much time, they might not even live to see it. One of the knights told Evelyn to take the prince, and together they ran away as far as possible. The knights alone would not have been able to cope with the enemies, especially without Devon. The dragon was already flying in their direction, so all the princess could do was grab her husband tightly and hope for the best. After a moment, she felt the same dark power present in his body, and they were very much surprised. She asked this dark power to help them scare away the dragon. A moment later, energy began to emanate from Evelyn and Devon, transforming into a bright light that bewildered the dragon. There was more and more energy, expanding both in width and in height, until it reached certain limits and frightened the dragon away completely. After a while, the girl could see the prince lying in her arms again. She did not understand what had just happened, but she was glad that they had survived. A moment later, the prince also spoke, confirming that he had finally regained consciousness, although he was badly injured. The princess quickly began healing with the help of divine powers. She began to apologize to Devon in her thoughts for what had just happened, for it was all her fault. She felt something strange every time she used the divine powers. It was as if she was being drained of her energy, and she was getting weaker and weaker. This healing took away the last of her strength she had left after such a powerful barrier that the unknown dark force had helped her to set up. Evelyn could not lose consciousness as long as the dragon was near. Suddenly, Hilda appeared on the field and found the princess lying unconscious on the ground. She seemed to be broken after using her magical powers. Laughing softly, Hilda decided to help Evelyn one more time because she could not help what she did not like when she was not interested. While in a state of incomplete consciousness, Evelyn was able to see Hilda, wondering why she was always helping her. She realized that the maid, or rather what was controlling her now, could read minds, so she decided not to draw the last of her strength to say it. She asked herself the question in her mind about who Hilda was. The maid did not answer the girl's question, but with the same smile on her face said that this was not their last meeting and that they would see each other again. Evelyn woke up in a room she had never seen before. She looked inside the room and saw Devon himself. She quickly jumped out of bed when she saw him. Her husband noticed this as well, so he decided to ask her a question. The girl was very agitated and asked him what had happened during the time she was unconscious. She was interested in how and why they were in that place. Devon wanted to ask the same question, since he also woke up and saw that they were in the middle of the settlement. The moment he woke up, he noticed Evelyn by his side. He had no one to ask about it. He was in this position for the first time in his life. He even wanted to see the talking servant next to him at that moment. Evelyn asked him what had happened to the knights and Eunice, who had been traveling with them all along, but he said that they were alone in the settlement. 
He said that he remembered the events up to the moment when the dragon scratched his back, so he wanted to ask the girl about what happened afterwards. Evelyn told him that while he was unconscious, the creature had reappeared and helped them survive. Devin wondered what she was trying to accomplish. Then the girl said that Hilda told her that she did not like it when it was not interesting, but the meaning of these words was still not fully understood. The only thing she was sure of was that Hilda had used this power to save them and move them to a safer place. Devin didn't like this help because it made them the automatic butt of all the talk and rumors for the smart people in the square. At least he was glad that few people knew his name. Evelyn still felt guilty about the wound Devin had received yesterday. She should have at least tried to treat it, which her husband refused to do because it didn't interfere with his movement. He realized that she had probably used a lot of her powers yesterday, but he also knew that divine powers also had the ability to harm their owner if they used too much. The girl confirmed this fact, so he insisted that she keep the rest of her strength to herself, as he could get treatment in the Empire. If she fainted again, it would make the situation much worse. In addition, there was another problem which was related to the fact that they could not stay in this settlement for too long because they had no money. Also, the prince had no documents with him to prove his identity, making his power completely useless. In addition, he had lost his sword, so they lost confidence in the danger as well. Then the girl asked how they ended up in this hotel, and the man replied that he had sold a button from his clothes because they were the most valuable thing he had right now. This made Evelyn laugh and made Devin angry because he didn't find the situation as funny as a girl. He had to act quickly, as he was ready to lose consciousness at any moment due to his injury. Despite the fact that the owner of the shop where he sold his buttons looked at him very strangely, he still managed to find the strength to get to the hotel. The girl did not laugh at the man himself, but rather at his ingenuity. She praised him because she realized that he hadn't done something like this for a long time, if not ever in his life. Then the girl offered to sell some of her jewelry with precious stones, which were definitely worth as much as his buttons. She couldn't walk around the village in that dress, so she trusted Devin to go back to the shop and sell her jewelry. And on the way to the hotel, Evelyn asked him to buy her some clothes. As they were walking down the street of this settlement, the girl asked where they were supposed to find the knights and Eunice, to which Devin said that they needed to return to the Empire first. The girl noticed a lot of stares from passers-by, which were most likely caused by the new clothes that Devin had bought her. She knew he might do something like this, but she hoped for the best. When the girl held the dress in her hands, she assumed that Devin had decided to take revenge on her for laughing at his ingenuity and decided to disgrace her in public. The truthfulness of this was also emphasized by the fact that the man had a terrible smile on his face, which immediately told about all his intentions. The girl noted that it was impossible to find such outfits even on purpose, but Devin said that the shopkeeper himself had offered this dress when he asked who it was for. Devin replied that the dress was for his destiny, so the shopkeeper had advised him to choose it. Evelyn did not believe in fate, so she assumed that the shopkeeper was clever. She still could not believe that the prince could say such a stupid thing with such an emotionless face. She was not in the most comfortable position in front of the people of the settlement. Finally, she decided to ask if they had enough money to get to the empire, to which her husband replied in the negative. She then asked where they were approaching right now. There was a temple in this house, so Devin decided to visit it. Evelyn hoped that he did not intend to sell her divine power to the temple, but he said that he had not even thought of it. Devin replied that he had some friends in the temple who could help them, or at least try to do so. At the temple, the man was immediately met by an old friend of his, named Phalos, who immediately made him uncomfortable. He apologized for his behavior, explaining that he had not seen his old friend for a long time. Phalos also noticed that his old acquaintance did not come alone. Devin himself emphasized that he and his current companion were to get married very soon. Phelos was very surprised, but he was honored to meet Devin's future wife. The blonde man said his full name, introducing himself as Phelos Kivon. As he repeated the words to himself, he did not pay attention to what Devin had just said. He had missed the information that his old friend was about to get married. At the tea party, Phelos apologized for his reaction, 
because he simply could not believe that his old friend was really getting married. The girl knew that the family of Kibian was not the most influential in the empire, and she wondered why one of his sons served as a priest in the temple. The man noticed that her gaze was too piercing, so he assumed that she meant to say some praise in his direction. But the girl said that she was just looking at him because he was different from the usual priests. He was used to hearing this quite often, but he noticed that Evelyn was very observant. He explained that he had special skills that made him different from others. Before showing them, he asked permission from Duan's future wife, who said he could address her by her first name. The girl was a little shocked when the priest grabbed her arm. Devon also noticed this and asked Phelos to behave more politely. The man with the blonde hair suggested that she was the one who had lifted the curse from Devon. She wondered how he knew that, but he pointed out that he had warned her about his special powers. His ability was that he could see and feel the abilities of others, and he could discern so much divine power within Evelyn without any problem. He was very interested in the power that lurked in the girl's soul, for it was the first time he had seen only one person possess such power. However, he also noticed that in addition to the divine power, there was something else in the girl that he could not see, so he decided to ask her about it. After examining this power in a little more detail until his interlocutor answered the previous question, he asked another, indicating that the girl had dark magic inside her. Evelyn didn't really understand what he was talking about, but he clarified that she had a lot of divine power, but it was also mixed with dark magic, which looked quite dangerous. Phelos had only one assumption, that most likely this dark magic could have appeared as a result of Devon's treatment, which could only be revealed after he gave an accurate answer as to whether he had been treated by this very lady. The man also felt an Evelyn-like energy in Devon's right eye, which made the priest wonder what had happened between the two of them. Devon didn't know much about this power. All he knew was that it wasn't an ability or magic, but rather a force from another dimension. Dark magic was known to be the power of demons, but he thought it was a different creature, even though, according to Phalos, the deity did not actually exist. Since the man had recently spoken of divine power, he also clarified that this power did not belong to the true god, but only to the source of some power, which was suddenly being called a deity. When Devon told his old friend that the Temple of the Empire also used dark magic, Phalos became interested and suggested that this was possible, since Devon's eye had similar magic in it. Devon confirmed that he was going to visit the capital to investigate the case and get rid of the dark magic that still remained in him. The priest said that the issue with the dark magic belonging to Evelyn was urgent, because if they decided to leave it alone, she might die. Phelos went on to say that the couch did not have divine powers, so the black magic was only in its right eye, and Evelyn, as the owner of the divine power, could not have dark magic as well. She wondered whether in this case there was a solution to the situation, as with the healing by divine power, as was the case with Devon. To this, Phelos replied that he did not know the exact method of treatment, and decided to ask the girl about the weakness in her body when using the divine power. Then she remembered that when she was treating Devana's right eye, she felt weak and wanted to give up, and after that, every time she used her powers, she felt a sharp decline in strength. Not having heard an answer to his questions, the man also added that this type of death would be painless, so she should have taken it as a blessing. A moment later, Devon's large hand hit the table with a loud thud. The man told her that she should not listen to him anymore if she did not want to get even more intrusive thoughts. He noted that the man had long since lost his sanity, as he himself wanted to die as soon as possible, so Evelyn was not above listening to the words of his mad mind. It no longer made sense for the virgins to listen to a man who knew nothing about the subject with which they had come to him, so it made no sense for them to stay there either. Since Devon and Evelyn were planning to continue on their way to the capital anyway, Phelos said that he was going to go there as well. This meant that he suggested that Devon and Evelyn head to the capital together. They were not worth worrying about, as the man was sure that his old acquaintance Devon could find to get rid of the problem. In fact, Phelos himself was very interested in learning about black magic and discovering new possibilities, so he promised to help them in their quest. Already in the carriage, they were approaching the capital. 
they had to shorten this long trip at least by talking. Phalos started first. He told Evelyn that he had known Karen and Devon for many years since they were children. Devam remarked that they had been bored with each other since childhood, so she now understood why he had been so rude to Karen. The man with blonde hair was wondering how his old friend Karen was doing because they hadn't seen each other for quite some time. To this, Devon decided to add a little about the knight's new life. Namely, he said that Karen had gone to Elian to check if there were any traces of black magic there. Phalos insisted that in case of such interesting events they could call him, but Evelyn pointed out that it could be dangerous, because he was still a priest and a son of the Kivion family, and his death would shake the position of his family. He was not concerned that this could be a threat to his status or security, as he had become a priest to avoid the responsibilities that were inherent in his family. Devon added that his old friend, who was Phelos, lived only for his own pleasure, so his boring moments were at the bottom of his list of important things. Nevertheless, Devon knew Phelos well, so he knew that the blonde man was also helping them in this case, just because he thought it was funny, so they should not have counted on him too much and taken his help as something serious. Eventually, when Phelos arrived in the capital, he had to say goodbye to them, as he had to return to the temple. He promised that they would meet again, but later. Evelyn finally realized she was in the capital when she saw the busy streets. She had no hope of seeing it again in the near future. She wondered if the knights and Eunice were in the palace. The prince replied that judging by the fact that there had been no news from them so far, it was likely. Nevertheless, they are soon to arrive at the imperial palace, from where it will be possible to send people to search and find something. They will live in this separate palace until the wedding. This meant that Evelyn had to meet with other members of the royal family. After all, she had decided to marry no one less than the Dark Prince, so she had to expect a personal meeting with the emperor from the first day of the marriage contract. Up to this point, the girl had asked her future husband to buy her a new dress, as this one did not look too respectable for the first meeting, to which he replied that he liked this dress, so there was no point in buying a new one. They had already visited a clothing store and picked out a suitable outfit, and at last Evelyn felt confident in this. She couldn't make a mistake from now on, especially when she met that ridiculous princess who was Devon's sister, Astrilla. Astrilla greeted them in the best possible way, beginning with the fact that his brother had left his estate and had come to the capital. When she addressed Evelyn, she called her the One. The poor girl did not even expect to meet Astrilla so immediately because they had not even prepared. The blonde girl, in accordance with etiquette, greeted her highness, but she remarked that her interlocutor should not be so dry, as they were soon to become a family. Devon wondered how his sister knew that he and Evelyn were getting married soon. He hadn't sent any letters, so he assumed she was having an affair with pigeons. Her highness replied with a laugh that there was no rumor in the empire that did not reach her like pigeons first. Devon was also interested in what his sister, that is, her highness, was doing here, for he had not even thought of telling anyone that he was going to visit. Despite this, she replied that they had come here immediately after hearing that her brother was going to visit the capital. She was not happy that her brother was using an official item, because it was not a reception. The girl was surprised by the fact that in the Empire, Astrilla was usually called ridiculous, but, as she thought at first glance, she was quite ordinary. Distracted by conversations with her brother, Her Highness lost sight of asking the girl her name, to which she replied very awkwardly, looking away. Astrilla was not interested in her first name, but in her last name. Evelyn felt very confused, as she thought she was supposed to use the surname Lantimos in the future, but calling herself that in front of the real Lantimos felt strange and excessive. However, she also had no desire to mention the Count's name, let alone identify herself as a member of this terrible man's family. Just the mere mention of this name out loud made Evelyn's mood instantly deteriorate. Without hesitation, Evelyn decided to say that she had no family. Estrella pointed out that she knew that the girl belonged to Count Diego's family, so her words were a lie. In this situation, Her Highness was not worried about this lie, but about the fact that if Evelyn's father heard her say such things, he would feel very sad. She did not want to tell Her Highness the whole truth, so she simply looked away in silence, trying to keep her mood stable. There was still a long time before Estrilla's brother's wedding, 
so she wondered why they were visiting the capital so early. Evelyn felt as if Devon's sister was openly pressuring him. She had experienced this pressure a moment ago, so she knew what she was talking about. This did not surprise her, because up until Devon's test, he had been the only contender for the imperial throne. She had heard many rumors that his sister had tried to overthrow him. When Estrilla asked, the girl replied that she wanted to see the capital because she had never been here before. It seems that the rumors that Estrilla had heard about Count Diego, or rather about his overprotective attitude toward his children, were true. Her Excellency also noted that, unfortunately, she had not seen Evelyn's brother Killian in the capital for a long time, although she had heard that he had taken an unspecified vacation. Evelyn was relieved that her brother was not in the capital, as she was afraid that they would meet him again. Her Highness claimed that she had not even heard about where he might have gone, because she was not the type to care about every little thing. She also missed that he might have gone to buy a wedding gift for his sister, as everyone had heard rumors that the Count's children were quite close. But Evelyn herself had simply stated the fact that her brother had indeed gone to buy her gifts. And Arrow had indeed heard too many rumors about Killian, namely those that said that one of the most serious knights was completely obsessed with his sister. Evelyn felt a lot of tension while talking to Estrilla. She looks quite simple on the outside, but after some not-so-long dialogue, it seems as if she sees through her interlocutor. After a moment, Estrilla decided to lighten the mood and said that since this was Evelyn's first visit to the capital, they were going to have fun. She invited her brother and his fiancé to follow her, saying that she had prepared something for them. She seemed to be a little afraid of her brother, but he claimed that it was most likely because of his right eye, as there were rumors throughout the capital that it had been cursed. The girl asked if the princess was that interested in the throne, and Devon said that it was something else, namely that she liked certainty. Upon entering the mansion, Evelyn and Devon were greeted by an endless array of luxurious clothes. Estrilla herself said that this was her gift for the new family member, as Devon had always been indifferent to such things. Devon said that he and Evelyn were not yet officially married, so all these gifts were too early, to which Her Highness suggested that they should be considered a payment for lifting the curse. All this time she was talking about Evelyn, so the maids hurried to take her away to try on her new clothes, as if they had not heard all her cries that she was against it. Now Estrilla could finally talk to her brother alone, like a real brother and sister who hadn't seen each other for a long time. During their conversation, Devon told his sister that he had saved Evelyn when his back was injured by a dragon. Her Highness found the story very touching. He wondered what Estrilla was up to because judging by the fact that Evelyn was taken out of the room against her will, Estrilla wanted to talk to her brother alone. Eventually, the prince became convinced that she wanted to talk to him about the curse. He was not surprised, but he could not tell her much, since he knew almost nothing himself. She asked him if he thought the curse was fair. He thought the question was a playful and indifferent one, because Estrilla herself was in the winning position. She was not interested in Devon's curse, and the reason she decided to talk to him alone was to test his fitness. The test of aptitude was a tradition that emerged after the founding of the empire and was the appointment of an heir by the temple. It refers to the test when the commanders were gathered in the temple and looked for divine signs. Astrilla still couldn't forget the night her brother's eyes suddenly went blank, as if the earth had left his feet and he had lost everything he had in this life. She wondered why the temple was running such a large empire. She was equally interested in whether Devon had ever asked himself this question. He missed that his sister knew something, namely that she should not have known, a game that the empire itself didn't know about and that was aimed against it. Her Highness made no reply to her brother's words, but merely stated that she was soon to become empress. This did not surprise Devon at all, nor should it have, since it was known throughout the empire. After she added to her words the phrase that her coronation would take place a little earlier than expected and planned, her brother was confused. He knew what she planned to do next, namely, to kill the emperor and the high priest with him, so that the day she would become empress would come much earlier. The maids dressed Evelyn with all the jewelry they could put on her to buy more time. The girl looked charming in this dress, because it was chosen by her highness herself. 
When asked who else Evelyn had to meet from her future husband's family, the maid only remained silent, continuing to tidy her hair. In the end, the girl hoped that it would not be necessary to meet the emperor. She wondered what Estrilla was up to, and she most likely had a reason for bringing the girl here and keeping her for quite some time. When asked by a maid who was putting the finishing touches on the princess's hair how long they had spent on the whole look, the frightened girl replied that they had spent about two hours. Evelyn now realized that Estrilla's main goal was to keep her away from Devon as long as possible. Two hours was enough time for something to happen, so she had to hurry to the prince, who had not yet recovered from his injury. Devon's wounds still hadn't healed completely, so she just hoped he was okay. Her feet carried her so fast that she didn't notice anything in her path, so she crashed into a knight coming around a corner. When she fell, she was able to recognize in this night an old friend of her future husband, Phalos. She wondered what her husband was doing here, since he was supposed to be in the temple, according to what he had said on the last day they saw each other. He looked completely different, more serious and tense. But after a moment, he recognized the princess and his face changed a lot. Evelyn's outfit was quite luxurious, which made Phalos confused and mistake her for a completely different lady he did not know. It was unusual for Evelyn herself to see Phalos in his completely different account, recalling Devon's words that the blonde man had lost his sanity and no longer wanted to live. She missed that he was definitely trying to hide something from his inner circle. Now she could only ask what he was doing in Her Highness's house, and in armor at that. He replied that in order to enter the palace, he had to wear this outfit. They had to speak very quietly, so that no one could hear their secret conversation. Because now Phalos was going to tell them about his purpose for entering the palace. If a priest is caught secretly entering the palace and concealing his identity, the matter will not be limited to deprivation of status. He could even be expelled from the Kivion family. Meanwhile, the sounds of shoes were heard down the long, magnificent corridor, followed by quite loud calls from the maids looking for Evelyn. Phalos decided to ask the blonde girl if she needed help and she nodded quietly so that no one would hear her. Eventually, he agreed to help her, but the girl now remained in his debt. Several of the maids, who would certainly not have been praised by Estrilla if she had learned that they had managed to lower Evelyn, whom she had asked to be kept under lock and key, called out loudly to try to find her. Phalos came out to them and charmed them for a moment with his appearance, which caused them to lose their minds for a moment. One of them said that they were looking for a beautiful girl in a charming and bright dress who might have passed by. He said that he remembered one of these girls, so when asked where this lady was headed, he replied that she was right here, taking the hand of one of the maids. The rest of the maids reacted to this charming gesture from the man with a very loud voice. They kept asking him what clan he belonged to and what order he was in. They wondered why they had not seen him before. Meanwhile, Evelyn was looking around the corner and thought that the best solution would be to stay put and run in the opposite direction. He really saved her by diverting all the attention of the maids to himself. Evelyn still remembered that she remained his debtor. The girl broke into the room where Devon and Estrilla were, despite all the warnings of the butler who was in front of the door to this room. He apologized to Estrilla for not being able to keep Evelyn out of the door. She had burst in so abruptly that he had not even been able to react. Her Highness forgave her husband for this, as they were already finishing their conversation with her brother. Estrilla noticed that the dress Evelyn was wearing now fit her like a glove. It perfectly complemented the girl's image, so Her Highness could not even imagine who the author of this masterpiece was. It turned out that Evelyn had spent so much time worrying for nothing, and she had seen nothing but the usual conversation between her brother and sister. Sitting down on the same couch as Devon, Evelyn wanted to make sure that he was definitely okay, and that nothing had happened to him in all this time. He noted that while the specialist was treating his wound, they had talked with Her Highness very little about the events that had taken place in the recent past. A conversation between Evelyn and Devon about him talking too loudly. Despite the fact that the girl herself was speaking very quietly so that no one could hear them, Estrella interrupted. Her Majesty stated that she had accidentally broken a glass and the glass had damaged her hand. She wanted her hand to be healed by someone who could overcome the curse of her brother Devon. This hint was due to the fact that Estrella was curious about how great Evelyn's power was, 
that she was even able to break the curse. Her Highness began to walk closer to the couch on which her brother and the divine-powered girl were sitting, continuing to ask for the answer to her request. Although it was very dangerous for Evelina's current state, she agreed to heal the princess's wound to prove her magical abilities. After the magic touched Estrella's arm, she immediately felt the pain disappear, but she also felt her brother's angry gaze on her, which only added to her mood. During this time, the blonde girl was able to complete the healing, but Arrow did not see the effect she expected to see. It was the same power that the rest of the gifted had. Evelyn herself noted that although it was a banal force, the difference was in volume, not power. The princess really expected magic from Evelyn. If she had satisfied her interest and even managed to talk to her brother, all her plans were complete. So she had to leave them alone. Before she left the palace, she turned to Devon and asked him to think carefully about all the things she had said to him earlier. Evelyn wanted to know what Astrilla had told him to think about, but he replied that very soon there would be different conversations here as well. Namely, because very soon bloodshed will begin in the Imperial Palace, which will be associated with the place for the throne. In the meantime, Karen had already reached Elian, whom he almost hated for spending too much time in a place where there were no carriages or horses. Elian was notoriously cold, so Karen had to get to the settlement and stay in a warm hotel there. Meanwhile, the palace was censoring the fact that they had to call Karen here, because Phalos was already there. The three of them could certainly come up with something. This was the right decision, as it was now unknown where the rest of the knights who had accompanied the prince on the day they disappeared had gone, and Karen could have replaced a hundred knights on his own. The most important thing for Duan now was to find the right person he could trust to bring the— Although the food at Devon's place was much tastier, Evelyn thought he was too picky about the palace food. The prince also told Evelyn that he had ordered his knights to find the girl she had spoken of earlier. The girl immediately realized that it was Cordelia. She thanked Devon, but was not sure whether they would be able to find her or not. Devam himself did not know the answer to this question, for he realized that she was highly valued in the temple, so it would be best not to expect much information. Evelyn realized, as did the prince himself, that finding Cordelia would not be the easiest thing to do, but they also had to do something first. The girl claimed that the butler had to rest after a long ride in the carriage, but he said that it was an order from his highness that he could not refute or disobey. He said he was fine, so he had to get to work. He noticed that the third dress on the left looked very luxurious, but attracted a lot of attention. Evelyn could not take in so much information from the butler, so she agreed to settle on the dress she was wearing. The man asked if she really liked it, as he remembered some experiences in his practice. After that, another long story of the butler was told, which the girl could no longer hear. She reflected on the whole situation and could not understand how she could have allowed it to happen. More recently, the prince was talking about Evelyn making her debut in high society, as she had not yet done so. Time was of the essence, so doing so soon was the most advantageous decision for them before it was too late. Recalling her first meeting with Devon, when she was kidnapped by Sir Karen and brought to the prince, the girl recalled that it happened right before the debutante ball. She was supposed to make her official debut before the wedding, and Evelyn herself noted that people from the temple were probably still looking for her. She would not have been well advised to appear in front of a large number of influential people after several years of disappearance. In response to the girl's words, which indicated that she was very excited about this event, the prince tried to calm her down, explaining that this was exactly what he was trying to achieve. Since they were looking for her everywhere in the temple, after Count Diego's negligence to her safety, they would definitely want her back. But if she makes her official debut in high society and with the status of a prince's wife, no one will dare to approach her closer than the permitted limits that she could now set for herself. Now she understood Devon's thought process and plans, but her worries and obsessions did not stop there. Still, she thought that such an influential temple with an excellent reputation would not act in public and choose the path of secret kidnapping. 241. As she turned her confused gaze to Devon's face, which was already wearing a creepy smile, it all became clear to Evelyn in an instant. 
The man himself was planning to provoke the temple servants to kidnap the girl. In this case, they will be able to use the situation to their advantage and get all the information they need. This was confirmed by the prince himself, since open dialogues with the temple were unlikely to provide the useful information they were desperately seeking, which is why they had to make the temple come to them. Devon was tired of running and hiding from the temple officials, so it was time to face them and defeat them with this brilliant plan. Evelyn had never thought they would be so busy in the capital, even with all the not-so-serious things, like trying on dresses and other preparations for the debutante ball. Still, it was worth it, because the girl immediately felt at ease when she saw from the outside almost her palace where she now lived. The footsteps behind Evelyn seemed so quiet and imperceptible that she did not even hear Karen approach her, who only made his presence known when he greeted her. He asked the girl what she was doing here at such a busy time to prepare everything for the ball. She could not answer because she was so frightened by the sudden appearance of the night. She knew that he had arrived a few days ago, but apologized for not being able to go out to see him that day. It was considered their first meeting in the capital. The knight said that as soon as he arrived in the capital, the prince did not even look at him, as he was busy looking for people to make a safe trip to his cook's capital. He also said that he could not find anything in Elian, because as soon as he arrived there and put his things away, the prince called him to return, so he had to leave with almost nothing again. Still, he thought that there was nothing left within Elian, but he was sent there to check it out, so he apologized to the girl for not keeping his promises. He had also heard that Evelyn had met Phalos and noticed that at first glance the blonde man seemed very unusual. She confirmed this, but said that he seemed like a good man. The knight also said that an old friend of his told him that the girl was to make her debut in high society in the next two weeks. Karen also told her not to worry, as his highness would definitely be able to help her and make time for her, to which she said that she had not had time to ask Devon himself. The knight asked again and added that if the prince was too busy, he could be her partner for this ball only. Her interlocutor answered honestly, as she had missed that he only wanted to attend the debutante ball, but then he remarked that he should offer it to her, and only her. She thanked Karen for his concern, but she would probably have to go with Devon, as she was soon to be his wife, and it would not be quite right to call a knight. Despite all of her previous apologies, Evelyn also added one of the less pleasant phrases that she would not have gone with Karen, even if she had the opportunity. When asked by her interlocutor about this very rude and painful answer, she said that she was more attracted to men who had some similar positive traits to Phalos. They were unexpectedly visited by Devon himself, for whom the girl's statement was as unexpected as for the knight. He thought that she was not impressed by men who prioritized their own selfishness and only enjoyed life, as was the case with Phelos. He asked her what she liked about him, to which she replied that she found him cute until he opened his mouth and started talking. Evelyn was also interested in why the prince came here, as he had previously said that he had a lot to do. To this question, Devon replied that he had found the person she was looking for. The girl reacted to this because she realized that it was about the main character of the original story, Cordelia, and this guess was confirmed by Devon himself. The man also wondered why Karen was resting, even though the knight had already finished organizing the guard at the small palace. Karen replied that he had been granted a few days' leave since the last dialogue with the prince, but a moment later Devon said that, as of today, his short leave was over and he was to return to his duties. Evelyn wonders what happened to Cordelia, but Devon only reports that he received information that she was still in the temple. It was as if the priests had taken away her divine power and stopped her for a while. By stopped, he meant that all the functions of her body were temporarily stopped. If she was now in such an ambiguous position, it meant that she had been in danger before, for which Evelyn continued to feel guilty. On their wedding day, she and Devon will have a large number of the temple's rooms open to them, allowing them to find and check on Cordelia's condition. Even if they do not succeed in taking her to a safe place from there, they will now at least be aware of her true condition without embellishment or exaggeration. The wedding day had already been set, so Devon said the ceremony would take place a week after Evelyn's debut. The butler, who unexpectedly joined their conversation, handed all the materials related to the temple to the future princess. 
The man added that it would be best if the girl took the time to read them before the wedding. Devin also said that the information on these sheets would be known only to the butler and Evelyn, making it completely confidential to unauthorized persons. As Evelyn looked over the information on the paperwork, she worried that they would not have enough time on the wedding day to see Cordelia. They would likely be watched the entire time they were in the temple. Duan said that, to be more precise, they would visit the church on the eve of the wedding, because they had to check everything in person before the ceremony. The temple officials did not trust the guards, so they trained their own men to be guards. On the day Devon took the examination for the succession to the throne, he noticed that instead of the guards, there were ordinary priests. It seemed a little suspicious to Evelyn that people like the temple servants, who were supposed to be keeping a dangerous secret, would be so unreliable in guarding the temple itself. Devon himself missed the fact that the temple officials were hoping for something else. Their possible security could include the fact that they were slipping sleeping pills into the people who were to attend the ceremony in the temple itself. He felt this firsthand, as he and Estrella had felt weak and slept suspiciously well the night before the exam. It turned out that they just had to deal with the sleeping pills, and then they could easily bypass the guards and get to Cordelia. The girl didn't even expect to save Cordelia right away, so their main task upon arriving at the temple would be to find out her condition. Evelyn thanked the prince for providing her with information about the temple and Cordelia, as she had requested. This was not the only thing the prince came to Evelyn with, so he also had to ask her if she had found a partner for the debutante ball. The girl was very nervous because she thought she was going to attend the ball with Devon, so she decided to check with him personally. He was unsure if he would be able to find the time to attend this Bali because he had so many things to do and work to do. Although there had never been a case in history of men attending a debutante ball with their wives, Evelyn hoped that he would honor her small request and keep her company for the day. Having not heard the expected answer, the girl should have visited Karen, who was preparing to organize a guard for the small palace. Tears appeared in Evelyn's eyes. She began to cry loudly while Knight Karen could not understand what had happened to her. After calming down a bit, the girl pulled his shirt sleeve and asked him to accompany her to Bali for the debutantes. She was even more shocked when Karen refused, commenting that Evelyn had already missed her chance. Later, he explained his refusal in more detail by saying that he had other things to do. Evelyn missed that it was related to the formation of the guard. The knight admitted that he had more to do than that, as his highness had suddenly overwhelmed him with a large number of errands. This may have been due to the fact that Devon saw Karen chatting casually with Evelyn, or perhaps because he had invited her to the ball. In this case, the girl had only the last option to invite Philos to the ball, as she would definitely not have been able to go alone. This was due to a lot of worries that she would not be able to solve alone. To begin with, she had to ask Fellows herself if he could go to the ball, but for that she needed to know where he could be at least approximately. She decided to ask the maid who was passing by about it. Evelyn asked her if the maid had had a conversation with a handsome gentleman a few days ago. It turned out that Fellows introduced himself by the name of his old friend Karen. Although this was both strange and incomprehensible to her, the maid would not have had an answer to the question of why the man had chosen Karen, so Evelyn moved on to the most important thing. The maid replied that they had only spoken for a short time, so she did not find out where he served, although it is unlikely that Fellows would have answered her. A moment later, Evelyn's butler approached her with a bundle in his hand. He commented on it as something she had asked him to get not long ago. This was not related to any secret. So the butler replied that he had obtained permission for her to enter the imperial library. The man also noted that it was quite difficult to get this permit, even needing Estrella's help, but now she was satisfied. This was much more important than the debutante ball, because in the imperial library, Evelyn would be able to find materials on black magic. The butler also brought dessert. He understood that the girl was busy, but she had to at least taste it before she left and she, in turn, realized that she could not leave the butler so easily. So she stuffed a lot of sweets into her mouth and ran away, thanking the butler with a mouthful of sweets, which was completely different from the rules of etiquette. The maid said that she was going to go with her, but the butler said that she would not be able to enter the library, as only aristocrats were allowed to enter. 
From the beginning, he was also worried and thought that Evelyn was impossible to understand. But the more time she spent with the prince, the more she dispelled the gloom. During all the time he served her, he learned that she had a good character. He was glad to see such a girl next to the prince. The butler also knew that her highness had sent a servant to keep an eye on Evelyn, so he asked the servant to tell her the above words. Already in the library, the girl met a librarian who agreed to help her. Together, they went to the room where all the books related to magic were collected. Also, a dark-haired girl who was a librarian said that books were not allowed to be taken out of the library, and she hoped that Evelyn knew this. The librarian opened the door and said that this was the room with the books with magic. When Evelyn was done reading or needed something, she would ring the bell and one of the servants or maids would come to her. While checking the shelves of the library, she eventually found the section on black magic and then found the book itself, which stated that the author had studied this topic for a long time. So this book was written to reveal the whole truth about this magic. Black magic came about as a result of a contract with a demon, and the price for the soul sold to the devil contained black magic, which is forbidden to the owners of a pure soul. This fact was confirmed by the greatest sorcerer in history and the owner of the magic tower in the West, whose opinion completely coincided with the opinion of the author of this book, Marcio Tellios. The girl had heard of Marcio Tellios. He was known as a great priest. She also knew that all the other authors who wrote books related to black magic were also hereditary priests. The problem was that there were no specifics in these books. Perhaps this was due to the great danger of records of dark magic. Suddenly, the girl noticed signs pointing to Phalos, who was also a hereditary priest. Suddenly, she heard the loud sound of a door slamming shut and cautiously peered over the huge shelves of books toward the door where Phelos was standing. He was surprised, but happy to meet Evelyn suddenly, and decided to ask her about the existence of a law that required a person to die. She wondered who was chasing Phelos now, as she heard loud banging on the other side of the door, and voices claiming to know that Phelos was inside the room. Suddenly, the man remembered that the girl was indebted to him for saving her, which she had needed the previous time she had met the maids. He noted that he was a very shy person, but he had taken risks to save Evelyn, so it was only fair to ask her to save him as well. The door eventually opened and the knights were there. The girl ordered them to skip all formalities and go straight to the purpose of the knight's visit. She wanted to know why they were knocking on the door so rudely, like barbarians. The knights explained their harsh behavior by saying that they were looking for a person who had entered the palace illegally. They also asked for permission to enter the room, but the girl refused, explaining that she was the only one using the room at the moment. The knight did not know what family this fair-haired beauty came from, but he was sure that she had no right to forbid him to do his work. She ordered him to go to the librarian and ask her who allowed her to enter the building, and then they would see if the man would talk to her in the same mood. Suddenly, one of the knights who had been behind him all along ran up to the commander. He told the commander that someone had told him that the lady was in the library with the permission of Her Highness herself. They apologized to Evelyn, but according to the rules, they had to verify her words. Since the lady had forbidden them to enter the room in which she was currently conducting business, they had to take her word for it. She assured them that she did not see anyone enter the room she was in, so the knights should not worry and go back. She promised not to tell the princess about their rude behavior. For now, she had to return to her books, so the knights had to go back through the high door that Evelyn slammed loudly. Phalos was very happy to be rescued because he had no idea that Evelyn could lie so well. Now she wondered what Phalos had really done to make her have to cover him up with the princess's name. The girl herself explained her stay in the library by saying that she was collecting information about black magic. Phelos quickly skimmed through the book on black magic and drew some conclusions for himself. The girl asked the man what he thought about it, but he replied that he assumed that the author would write a whole collection, but did not really expect it. He slammed the book down loudly and said that sometimes he too had thought about a secret place to investigate dark magic, but it was as if such a place simply did not exist. The girl was interested in the fact that Phelos was most likely also investigating black magic, but she was equally concerned about how he managed to impersonate Karen. 
He explained this by showing the girl a fake that imitated the Weibo family jewel that had been passed down from generation to generation. Although it was not real, it could be used to make people afraid. The girl pointed out that in order to make a fake, Phalos also needed the original item, so he explained that Karen had lost the real jewel to Phalos in a bet. The girl didn't understand why the temple was hiding the truth about black magic, but Phalos explained that the reason was not entirely clear, but judging by the circumstances, the owners of black magic had almost equal opportunities as the owners of divine magic, if not more powerful. It was also possible that the church officials felt that black magic could shake the faith of the parishioners, since both black magic and a contract with a demon would definitely cause them fear. Fellows could not name a specific person, but I know for sure that such power was impossible to ignore. So Evelyn's mind immediately went to Hilda, whose power was greater than divine. If they can't find the information in the library, they will need to go in search of it at a Swedish gathering, which is rarely held. But it brings together people who may know something about witchcraft. Remembering the debutante ball, Evelyn turned to Fellows, suddenly grabbing his hands. He wondered why the girl had taken his hands so suddenly. He admitted that he liked her too, but he didn't want to get into a fight with Devon. He was too excited by the girl's sudden actions, so he began to assume that she was interested in him because of his appearance, but at the same time it was a bit disappointing. The most important thing was that priests cannot marry, and he did not want to break the heart of such a lady. The girl and the others stopped the man, explaining that he had misunderstood her words and then wondered why she had taken his hand. Evelyn was not pleased that Fellows had made such a fuss about her action, which she did not even control, so she hastened to explain that she wanted to invite him to be her partner for the debutante ball. Looking at another refusal, the girl asked him to think about his decision again, as she could not go there alone because of the refusal of Karen Devan and Fellows himself. Phelos could not attend the ball because he was a priest, the girl did not understand this because there was no relevant law. The law did not really exist, but the men were more concerned about the rumors that could spread after the event. The fact that Karen could have been the girl's partner was logical, as he was a member of the prince's inner circle. If a stranger like Fellos joins the ball, the situation will immediately become tense and Evelyn will be the one who will have problems. Since Evelyn confirmed that she was staying in a separate palace, Phalos decided to take her a shortcut, in the form of an apology for his refusal. Evelyn missed that the man knew the area very well, which he explained by saying that Devon had lived here as a child when everything looked very old. She was interested in the fact that Devon used to live in a separate palace. It turned out that his childhood was before the curse, so he had a chance to become a crown prince. Almost a moment later they were there. This way was indeed much faster than usual. Since Phalos was already near the palace, she decided to invite him to have lunch with her. In addition, Devon was most likely also in this palace. Evelyn did not know that Devon had previously lived in a separate palace, so she assumed that he had been treated differently as a child. His own mother died immediately after his birth during childbirth, so he must have felt empty inside, and the current empress wanted to put her daughter Astrilla on the throne, considering Devon to be something superfluous. She wondered if Devon still felt guilty and angry with himself, but that was likely, given who he was now. After getting ready for lunch, Evelyn entered the room where Devon and Fellos were, but surprisingly, there was a strange atmosphere between them, as if they had quarreled. Evelyn also offered to invite Sir Karen to join them for lunch, as he was friends with Devon, but he refused, commenting that he was content with Phelos alone. Turning to Evelyn, Phyllis mentioned that she had recently asked him about the debutante ball, which made Devon startle and choke on his tea. The blonde man added that his refusal was too harsh, so he had thought it over, but he should still accompany the girl in case she really could not find a partner for the event. In this case, Devon himself had to intervene, noting that no one would allow the prince's wife to appear accompanied by an unknown priest from the Kibian clan. In response to Devon's words, the girl remarked that he had recently told her that he would be busy, but he said that he had not refused to be Evelyn's partner for the debutante ball. Duan also noted that the girl turned to Karen and even Fellos, but never asked the prince himself and did not ask him to set aside time. This led the girl to assume that Devon had spent all this time waiting for her to invite him directly. 
Evelyn could not ignore this situation, nor could she ignore a potential partner for the debutante ball. So she extended her hand to Devin and invited him to attend the event with her directly. Devin blushed a little with embarrassment, but eventually agreed to accept the offer that Evelyn had been asking for all day. After this suggestion, a loud laugh was heard from the side where Phalos was sitting. He apologized for his language, but he could not help himself. Their wedding seemed unlike any other, but for some reason he had a feeling that it would be a happy one. A maid had already dressed Evelyn for the debutante ball and offered jewelry that was the most visible and brightest, but the girl assured her that it was enough. Although the maid assured the girl that she would be the center of attention among all those who came to this ball without any jewelry, Evelyn herself understood that it would be more likely to be rumors about her than attention. She realized that from the outside, it looked very strange that she had been missing for two years and then so suddenly decided to marry a prince who was also considered cursed. This was enough to start rumors. Some spread many rumors about their marriage of great love, but they were still better than the rumors that this marriage was considered an arranged marriage. In reality, the two of them were collecting information about the temple and black magic. People in Bali were excited to see this strange couple who had been the center of all the rumors. Finally, they were able to see them with their own eyes. One of them asked the girl standing next to him if it was true that the prince intended to take the throne. She replied that this was most likely his intention, since he had no reason to come to the capital so soon after the curse was lifted. The guest of the ball also noted that he had heard some rumors that Devon had a serious quarrel with his sister Estrilla as soon as he arrived in the capital. Hearing all these rumors behind his back, Devon decided to change his train of thought and turn his attention to his beautiful future wife, who was standing next to him. He decided to ask his companion if she knew how to dance, and she replied that she had learned it quite well. Judging by all the bad habits Evelyn had, she was not a big fan of etiquette because she ate a lot of sweets, loved the food prepared by the chef at Devon's mansion, and ran away while her hair was being done. While dancing at the ball, Devon asked Evelyn not to step on his feet anymore, as he hadn't felt them for a long time. He was counting on the truthfulness of the girl's words, but it turned out that she was lying. Evelyn herself refuted all of Devon's words, commenting on her confusion in dancing, by saying that she hadn't danced for a long time and had forgotten all the moves. The girl did not seem to be going to admit her lie, so this answer brought a subtle smile to the prince's face. Whispers had already begun to circulate at the ball, as most of the attendees had never seen the prince smile like that with his wife. Of course, he would be smiling because he had the good fortune to marry such a beautiful girl, who also lifted his curse. She was described as an angel who had just descended from heaven. The other ladies asked Evelyn about her brother Killian. They wondered if he had come to tonight's ball, but she only replied that he was on vacation. One of them was worried that he had met someone, but it was strange that he had not yet announced his engagement or his marriage. To this, the future princess said that her brother was too busy with work to make such statements. After the ball, the girl felt very tired. Today she got up at dawn, got dressed and prepared for this ball, and then she had to dance and listen to all this terribly tiring talk. Behind her, Devon appeared, adding a little color to the girl's terrible mood. He said that she didn't need to talk about tedious topics with everyone in a row while putting on a smile. She had no need or reason to look low in the eyes of others. It would have been different if they also treated her with respect because she smiled at them, but this was not the case. Devon also thought it was very strange that Evelyn had recently stopped looking him in the eye. He was worried that he might have done or said something wrong, so he decided to ask the girl herself. He began to fix his hairstyle, which he had recently styled. When the girl asked him why he was doing this, he only replied that he had overdone his appearance and must have looked very awkward in Evelyn's eyes. He noted that it was the butler who recommended that he appear in front of the girl in this way, as they were supposed to look like a happy couple who were about to get married. She also didn't want him to misunderstand her, so she clarified that during the time she had seen the prince without the blindfold, she had managed to see their true beauty. His left red eye reminded the girl of the red sun, and his right eye, which was under the influence of dark magic, looked like the night sky. 
Of course, they had to get rid of the right one as soon as possible, but for now, it looked very touching. He tried to leave Evelyn's company as quickly as possible with the comment that he would bring them some drinks. The girl assumed that his departure was due to the fact that he did not like to talk about this topic. The girl remained on the same balcony, continuing her suffering about a very difficult day. She recalled that in the original story, almost nothing was told about Devon's childhood, so she didn't know anything. He was a child who was born with cursed eyes that did not match the golden color of the eyes that had been passed down in the imperial family from generation to generation. He was called the Prince with Red Eyes. This was his nickname as a child, as described in the book. There were few episodes like this, so we could say that Evelyn remembered them by heart. Suddenly, Evelyn saw a child in front of her who fit the description of Devon that had just come to mind. It was a strange feeling, not only because she thought of Devon at every opportunity, but also because of the whole situation. She told the boy sitting on the terrace balustrade that he was not supposed to sit on the surface, which was made for completely different purposes. In addition, it was dangerous to sit on it, so the girl, as an adult, should have at least tried to persuade the boy to return to the floor. As she began to examine all the details of the shared picture she had seen a moment ago, she saw the young man's dirty clothes and the small flower in his hands that reminded Evelyn of a daisy. The boy continued to sit on the balustrade, not saying a word, just looking at the girl. She continued to study the boy, noticing his resemblance to Devon. He had the same black hair and red eyes, which reminded Evelyn of the little prince, though she didn't know exactly what he looked like back then. She began to walk closer to him, repeating her earlier words about how it was too dangerous to sit at such a high distance from the ground itself, but in the same moment, the boy purposefully jumped off the balustrade, beginning his fall. Evelyn walked to the edge of the terrace, leaning on the balustrade where a small boy had just been sitting. Her shoes were uncomfortable and her feet were too tired, so she twisted one of her legs when she stepped on the floor. 